So how many of you here are actually interested in PhDs? Good. Okay. So R2 uh, and Jerome have already mentioned that this is a very strong group. I mean, when you're going into research, it's important, if you can be, to be in a sort of vibrant group. It's well connected internationally. And we certainly are with a very big group. We focus on fundamental theoretical physics, so there's lo lots more to theoretical physics than just what we do, but within that remit, <coughs> string theory, cosmology, gravity, quantum field theory, we're one of the, certainly one of the best in the UK and internationally. So it's a very active area. We have a lot of postdocs, we have a lot of faculty, we have a lot of postdocs, and in fact, over the next five years, we just recently won two very big ER European grants and also a UK EPSRC grant. Um, so there's literally millions of euros over the next five years, which means that there'll be actually even more postdocs around. Uh, I think we've just hired five this year. So we'll be an even bigger group over the next five years, which is the years relevant for you. Um, and we'll have a lot of money for visitors. So it'll be sort of chaos, actually, for those of us who are here all the time. It's, it's going to be a busy time. So very active means lots of visitors, lots of international visitors, particularly with all this money, probably a lot of visitors from the US as well. And because we're in London, we're easy to get to, we're well known as well. People want to come and give talks here. And so I expect it'll be very active indeed. PhD students are very much uh, encouraged to get involved in the seminars. Well, not so much get involved, but come to the seminars, even ask questions. Um, it's, it's really an important thing, wherever you go, do go to seminars, and I say that because if those of you become PhD students, you'll often notice that PhD students don't tend to go to seminars. It's very, very important, right from the beginning of your PhD, even if you understand nothing, that you go to seminars. Because just by osmosis, by the end of three years, you will understand something. At least you'll, you'll know what it is people tend to give talks about. Uh, and that's, that actually coming out of your PhD and then applying for postdocs is very important. Imperial has a very strong uh, geometry group in maths for those of you who sort of go into more formal string theory areas. We also have a very strong astrophysics group as well for those sort of on the cosmology side. Um, and I should just say, just to be completely clear, we don't do any traditional condensed matter physics. There is a separate condensed matter theory group in the physics department, so we just don't do that. There are some links between string theory and condensed matter, which we have been involved in, but that's not traditional condensed matter physics. And we also don't do particle phenomenology model building. Um, and in fact, I don't think even the particle physics group here doesn't have anyone doing model building. So if, the, if that's what you're interested in, you know, we're, we're not the place to do that. But all the other areas of fundamental theory we certainly are involved in. So Artu's already talked about this, the main areas in terms of research are string theory, cosmology, gravity, and quantum field theory. So I won't say that again. In terms of applying for PhDs with us, we expect um, people to have typically a four-year undergraduate degree in physics or applied maths, subject you have taken enough theoretical physics courses, um, or a three-year degree plus a master's. We t it's very unusual we would take someone off a three-year physics degree alone. Um, it's also entirely possible to apply with a four-year undergrad and a master's, but um, you may as well apply just after the four-year undergraduate degree and see if we accept you or not. Um, so it's not necessary. It's not necessary to have done a master's, as I say, but it certainly does help if we've got two candidates who've done equally well at undergraduate level, but one of them is also doing a master's, who are we going to pick? Okay. So. Um, I should stress, there is no need to have done our masters. There are other masters around. So any masters is, is, is good. Um, and so doing our masters is neither a prerequisite nor, um, nor a route to guarantee you a PhD in our group. I need to make that clear. We, um, fortunately for us, we have a lot of applicants for PhDs. And unfortunately for you, we have relatively few PhD places. So uh, this is probably an underestimate. I expect we may even have six PhD positions this year, um, which is m more than usual. Um, certainly we'll have more than four, and it varies because some of the funding is not under our control, and sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. 
But given that we have a lot of candidates and few places, um, it is, at least from past experience, uh, a necessary prerequisite is that you have a strong first class degree. Okay. Um, and by a strong first class degree, if you want me to be more specific, historically, people certainly are coming in the top 10% of their class. So many of you may not know where you are in your class, um, but maybe you could find out, you know, ask your tutors. But a ranking is quite useful. It's also, when you apply, um, your referees hopefully will also give your ranking. Please ask your referees to give your ranking. It's very unuseful to have a reference with no information. In. Okay. So, if, uh, so just, if you're sort of on the borderline of a first, a low first, it's probably not going to be good enough, okay, unfortunately. That is not to say there are not many areas of physics where you could quite happily go off and do a PhD. So I want you to be aware, if you go into theoretical physics, it's a particularly competitive subject with rather little money. Um, and therefore, the, the, the bar is a bit higher than in other areas. So do consider that when you're applying, because you don't want to throw away your opportunity to go into research just because you, you happen to apply for theory. Make sure it's, if you apply for theory, it's theory you want to do. That said, if you have got a strong first, then we definitely encourage you to apply. That's also said, you have to apply not just to us, but apply all over the UK. Okay? I really emphasize that. If we have some largest number of applicants and there are only five places, you can imagine that there is, just by virtue of sifting through a large number of application forms and the interview process, there's a random element to how it turns out. You have a good day on the interview, you have a bad day, maybe you get the place, you don't get the place. So to make your odds better, you really do have to apply to all the universities in the UK or a number of universities that have good theoretical physics departments. There are many of them. So if you're applying to us, you really should be applying to at least five other places. For example, Oxford, Durham, um, Edinburgh, Swansea, UCL, King's, and so on. So there's actually a very long list. The UK is very strong in theoretical physics. And that means that hopefully, even if you have a bad day with us, you have a good day with someone else. Okay. <clears throat> How to apply? The application procedure is done online, and therefore uh, it's a one, one system for all. It doesn't really work for anyone. Uh, the instructions on how to go about this, and uh, well, pretty much uh, all the instructions you need are on our website. So if you go to the Theoretical Physics Group website, go to Graduate and then PhD Programs, uh, we have instructions on how to apply. It's very simple. You just apply online. You state uh, that you want to apply to the physics department in our group. You have the choice of two groups when you apply for a PhD, or you have two options, or indeed you could apply for a master's and a PhD. Uh, so you can certainly apply for the master's, as R2 has said, and for our PhD program. Um, you have to have a preference, and so please, if you want to apply to our group, put us as the first preference. We have many more applicants than other groups in the <coughs> physics department, and so it's very likely that if we're going to make you an offer, the other group will snap you up. And if you're not our first preference, you know, if you haven't put us as the first preference, the other group will make you an offer and we can't. Once the other group's made you an offer, that's it. So if you apply to us, we really have to be your first preference. This form, of course, is designed for groups which maybe even just have sort of five candidates applying every year. Um, and so they can chat away to all their candidates and say how great they are and what they do and tailor proposals for them and projects. And we simply are not in that position. So we do not expect you in the form where it says proposed supervisor and proposed research, we don't expect you to put anything of uh, a specific nature there. You know, tell us about your interests if you've done project work, maybe write something, say I've done this project work. I strongly advise you when you apply to us and to everyone else in the UK that you're going to apply for, um, apply to, to say you're just interested in theoretical physics. You always have been, and you're very keen to pursue an academic career if you can, and you're very open to any area. I just can't see any advantage in doing anything other than that. So if you say, I want to solve quantum gravity, that immediately, for me, <laughs> raises alarm bells that you don't understand 
what it means to solve quantum gravity, how hard it is. It's a tough thing. People have been trying to solve it for 80 years or something. Uh, so it's easy to say, but it's a bit concerning. Um, but also, you know, you're only going to rule out options if you're too specific. So it is useful if you, if you genuinely don't, are not interested in working on string theory, even if we made you a PhD offer, or vice versa in cosmology, do say, but of course you're just ruling out options. You may as well just be open and then at the interview stage say, well, I don't actually want to work on that. And because of the large number of applicants we have relative to the number of places, we can't discuss projects with people. We won't discuss possible supervisors with people at the stage. So the stage at which that happens would be at the interview stage. So we will invite you, I'll talk about that in a minute, when we invite you to interview, we'll ask you about your interests, and then at that point we'll try and form a view who would likely be a good supervisor given your background and your interests, um, and who is available to supervise that year. So it's, it's a slightly impersonal process at this point. It does get more personal later if you get to that. Funding is a major issue for us. The reason we have a small number of places is twofold. Um, one, we just don't have very much funding. Um, secondly, in fact, out of the number of applicants we have, it's statistically, uh, theory is quite a hard subject. You need to be good to do it. And we typically actually don't have more than about 10 people who we would want to offer PhD places to. There's, we, we certainly don't want to offer a PhD place to someone we don't think would get the PhD uh, in the end. So in terms of funding, we have unfortunately some fairly major constraints. Probably this year we're going to have four funded places that we allocate. So we're in control of this money, so when we interview people, we decide, yes, we want this person or we don't, and we can offer this money. That money, if, uh, if you're eligible for it, is very good. It covers three and a half years. Um, typically, because of the cycle, the academic cycle, people stay on for four years. So you should understand this three and a half years should be averaged over four. But it covers, for the duration, essentially, of the three and a half years, it covers all the tuition fees um, and then subsistence, which is uh, not insubstantial. I think it's about £17,000 a year now tax-free, which is actually pretty reasonable, and it's certainly good enough to live in London. Uh, people certainly manage it. Um, but it is, uh, to be eligible, you have to be a UK or home student, by, which means that either you're a UK national um, who has been resident in the UK at least recently, or you're an EU national who has been resident in the UK for the last three years. So which in practice means that you've done your undergraduate degree here and then you're applying for PhDs. So if you're an EU student who's um, doing, you know, maybe, maybe you're Spanish, you did your undergrad in Madrid and then you're doing a master's here, you won't be eligible. If you're an EU candidate in that category, um, the funding will cover your fees, which are around £6,000 a year, I think, but it won't cover maintenance, which is your living expenses, so you'll have to find that money elsewhere okay. in terms of this funding that we can allocate. Foreign countries, particularly overseas countries, non-EU countries, often have um, some limited funding for nationals to go abroad, so if you're in that category, do look at your country. India, for example, have some programs in conjunction with the British Council. Chile have some programs. Um, we have a student this year funded from a Chile uh, national scheme. So do have a look. Um, if you come up with something and you need some letter of support from us, then we can do an interview, see if we would want you. And then, um, so you have to contact us in advance with that. Note, some candidates have their own funds, personal or government funding. And, um, and I just want to emphasize that we do require a similar standard of candidates in order to accept them onto a PhD place. Okay? So it's still hard, even if you come with your own money, it's still hard to get accepted for a PhD place. Um, and that's just because it's, you know, theory is hard, there's just no point in us taking on students who um, we think won't benefit from doing a PhD and won't benefit us. The last couple of years have changed a little bit because there are these Imperial College scholarships, which I'm sure you may have seen online if you've looked. 
this is a, a, a very nice scheme, um, but it is limited funding and it is across the whole university. It's a very big university. I think 60% of it is medical. Probably didn't know that. So uh, what you see in this campus is actually a less than half of the whole university. And I believe there's something of order 50 scholarships. So getting one of these is hard, is highly random, frankly, and um, is in general unlikely. <laughs> so we, last year we got one. Uh, we have very good candidates, so um, we would hope maybe to get one this year, but it's certainly not guaranteed, and I, I would be surprised if we got more than one. These are not under our control. These four places will be certainly under our control. This money is not under our control, so we don't know until quite late on whether we get it or not, and it, there's a considerable degree of uncertainty about it. It says online that you should contact uh, a supervisor, arrange a research project before you even apply, okay, and then say you want to uh, apply for a scholarship. I don't know who designed this scheme. It's obviously not been terribly well thought out. We have far too many people applying for that. And in fact, the group as a whole can only put forward a few candidates. So we then have to subsequently rank them. So we ask you, therefore, please do not contact supervisors beforehand. Just apply. Don't put, uh, you know, don't just, it doesn't matter who you put in as your proposed supervisor or your proposed research topic. Do say that you want to be considered for funding like this. And there's a little form when you apply that you have to attach saying, I want to be considered for a scholarship. So please do that. Um, and then when we see all the applications, we would try and then do interviews. And at that point, we can retrospectively put you forward for one of these scholarships. And in fact, the deadline is somewhere around um, March, April, uh, or I can't remember, March maybe. So we've got plenty of time to do that. There's also a Schrodinger scholarship. It's the same deal. Please do not contact us. We will put you forward if we think you're likely to make it. Um, as I said, uh, there are also <coughs> other scholarships, and Artie said, associated with uh, various countries, and details can be found on the registry website. Okay. The deadline is the end of uh, the month, but <coughs> if you want to ensure that you're considered for these scholarships, please apply as soon as possible, so this week if possible. Just it takes a while for the applications to filter through to us. The procedure then is we'll interview between 15 and 20 people in late February, early March. We'll make offers in March. When we make offers, uh, the funding that we can allocate comes from research councils and they stipulate that we can't ask someone to make a decision before the beginning of April. So there'll be a sort of quiet period where we make offers to people, everyone else is making offers in March. And then nothing will happen until April because no one will turn down or accept anything until they know what position they're in. And often people will get offers from multiple places. So it's a sort of silly system, really, in some ways. And then come the beginning of March, we might have someone accept. We might have someone reject because they're going to Princeton or wherever. And then um, it's chaos because then uh, there's no restriction. We will then make new offers. Other people will be making new offers, and there's no restriction on how turnaround time for those. So if you don't hear anything, uh, you know, if you hear something before uh, the end of March, don't, <laughs> you shouldn't really, just speaking personally, you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't accept it straight away because you don't have to, and you should see what happens with your other applications. Um, but don't worry if you don't hear from us. It's very likely that we're still going down the list, and, and there will be movement after um, the beginning of April. Just a note for part three students. Are there any part three students here? Then that doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so whilst the process seems rather impersonal now, at the interview stage, we will try to discern your interests, your strengths, weaknesses, and so on, and try to match supervisors who will be taking on students that year to students, um, and we'll try and do it in a sensible way. And uh, obviously aligning their interests. And then supervisors typically can also modify projects if there's a more formal person that they're taking on or a more applied person. They often have a range of ideas. Um, if you want to know uh, the sort of projects that people work on, just look us all up on the 
web pages. You can see lists of our publications. That's the sort of area we work in. We often don't know what we're going to be doing in six months or a year's time, so we couldn't tell you a detailed project proposal in advance. Uh, just a few sort of silly words about PhDs. Three and a half years is a very long time. The only reason to do a PhD in theoretical physics is because you enjoy theoretical physics. That is the only reason to do it. Uh, fame and fortune are not, <laughs> you will neither become famous nor earn a fortune, uh, even if you do very well. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful achievement to have a PhD, but the process should be fun, and often it's, it's a struggle, it's a personal struggle. It can be quite hard at points. Um, obviously, the benefit is that you will understand how the universe works in some very fundamental level, possibly better than anyone else in the world, or at least a handful of people will be the only ones who know it as well. Even having a PhD in theoretical physics is not uh, going to guarantee that you can become a theoretical physicist long term. You should know that. It's, it's a tough subject then to go on and do postdoc work in, and certainly very tough to get faculty positions in. Um, that said, however, uh, even if you can't get a postdoc, um, job opportunities after tend to be very, very good. So some people switch fields to other areas of research and do postdocs in them, because you have a lot of transferable skills in theory, so it's very nice from that point of view. Um, but if you decide that you've actually had enough of research and want to get a job, I don't know of anyone who couldn't after doing a theoretical physics PhD. And they all go off and earn far more than us, or if they don't, it's by their choice. So, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, if you can stick it out and you really want to do it, it's a great thing to do. So the application process is online. Deadline is the end of the month. This is a, it's a very strong group. It's a very friendly group. It's a nice place to do a PhD. The PhD students are a very uh, friendly bunch. They have their own seminar every week that no one else is allowed to go to, which is great. Uh, there's a wide range of interests. If you have further questions, you could do feel free to email me, although please do have a look at our website as well, as it may answer uh, your question before I do. OK, so are there any? immediate questions now on PhDs. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand when you uh, start figuring out which project you're going to work on. Because you say you apply without a particular project in mind. Yeah, so then we then interview some fraction of the people who apply. Yeah. We'll then discuss the sort of general background, what they've done, what they're interested in. If they say, if they happen to be interested in cosmology particularly, and they've got a good background that seems compatible with that, we would then try and match them up with a cosmology supervisor, if this is someone we want to take on as a PhD student. And then they would probably talk to that supervisor and discuss what the supervisor would probably make, uh, make them do for their project. And then you would decide whether you want to accept our position or not. So the whole process actually is quite slow, so there's certainly time for this communication to happen, but only after the interview stage and only after we, well, during the interview stage and subsequently when we start making offers. And of course, when you get offers from elsewhere, it's useful if you can say, well, I'm, I'm going to be working with this person, you know, so that, uh, or I'm going to be working on this, but actually I'd really like to work on something else, you know, you can start to bargain a little bit between different institutions. I, you know, I do advise you to do that a little bit if you have the option. Um, you, you know, if, if one place makes you an offer which is particularly good but you don't particularly want to go there, you can go back to the other places that have made you offers and say, wow. So there's a certain amount of give and take, but we're, highly, we're quite constrained. We only have 13 faculty. Probably half of them will take on a student this year. And so not everyone's going to take on a student. And they will supervise in, in their special area. You can't uh, say, well, I want to work on this, because it's, it's very likely that there just isn't the expertise in the group or no one wants to supervise you on it. Any other questions? Is um, quantum gravity one of the topics covered by the group, or is there many a focus in string theory? No, no, no. There's quantum gravity as well. Faye Dauker specifically just works on quantum gravity. Jonathan Halliwell works on things related to quantum gravity. And the string group obviously work on things related to quantum gravity as well. 